I'm really overwhelmingly pleased that you guys would take the trouble to, to allow me to guide you through something that's really simple but really important to me. I have to say right from the beginning, Christy knows my work better than almost anybody I've met besides my wife and the two wonderful young artists that I work with that helps me make it. And it would appear, given the title of the show, that she, sh she knows the work better than I do. Because this is the best working title for an exhibition that I've ever had. The most important to me. When I, when I left America due to a variety of reasons, one uh, including Richard Nixon uh, the first time, uh, and thought that I might not ever come back, I took three strange CDs with me. Uh, the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and the record that Paul Simon had with uh, Kodachrome on it, and Paul Robeson singing Sweet Low, Sweet Chariot. And I uh, just blows my mind completely. And because first he was important to me and, and all those songs. So who would have thought that I might actually be lucky enough to have somebody understand that what that song means is so important to me. I've never spoken about it to a soul. So just gobsmack me to a point of uh, further dumbstruckness, which probably means I'll talk more than I ought. Anyway, rivers, hell, I've been making water pictures for a long time. I'm so proud of this show, by the way. Just, I told Patrick and, and Christy, it won't matter to anybody, but this is my hundredth solo exhibition. And I'm, I, I can't believe it. And here in this, what for me is almost hallowed ground, and I mean that, I'm, I'm a lot of things, but I have no ability to be cynical or ironic, which is probably pathetic, but I have none of that uh, capacity in myself. So this is a great moment for me. But for a long time, for 25 years, I've been making ocean pictures. And when I'm working in what, due to the poet that probably influenced me most, a great dead poet named Theodore Rethke, his posthumous book that won the Pulitzer Prize in 66 or 67, called The Far Field. When I'm in what, through his work, I think of these days as the far field, which is where I'm far flung, I am. I, when I come back, generally speaking, back to Scotland, where my recent body of work called Scattered Waters uh, is from, of, and 30 years of river pictures in there, or when I come back to any place that I really like, like the home that I feel deeply still in America, that I always work with rivers because they seem to me to be the arterial kind of uh, lifelines of, of the land itself. And, bringing something, nourishment of some sort, back and forth. So when I <clears throat> started having an idea about how to incorporate this long-term love of rivers with this sort of strange, more or less externalized, but still deeply important and emotional to me, view of the oceans as they connect the Atlantic Basin into this thing I call an atlas of emptiness and extremity, I kept thinking, okay, what are the, how can I, how can I put it together to make sense out of my need to pay tribute, if you will, to the rivers and actually have it make sense to the project? Well, it dawned on me not very quickly, but very thoroughly that the three great American rivers that flow into the Atlantic were the Rio Grande, the Mississippi, and the Hudson. They've, the three rivers that changed the cultural condition uh, by being settled around of the America that we know. And then the great Canadian River, the St. Lawrence, doing the same. Previously having worked with the La Plate, the, um, the Amazon and the Orinoco in South America because they do the same, I thought, okay, I can continue this, if you will, thank you to the, to the lifelines of the land as they also replenish and ref refresh the oceans by working whenever possible from source to sea. So, uh, and in the way also beginning to reacquaint myself with homeland. I'm an exile, uh, sort of a daft word in the way. I, I live outside America, it's probably like I work outdoors. Um, it's easier to think of it in those kinds of terms, um, simpler too. So we start here and and 
It's interesting, you know, Mississippi. A big argument that's sort of moot, of course, is the Missouri really 115 miles longer than the, the Mississippi or who the fuck cares anyway. Uh, Missouri is actually probably longer, but uh, I like the idea that the Mississippi is the longest uh, river in America and that the Missouri is one of them and that the Rio Grande is the third longest river in America. And I've seen every single inch of these rivers from the sources to the seas. And this picture here, I'm finally finding, you know, um, one of the great things is there's a, the, the northmost bit of the continent, or of, of continental USA, is a thing called the Northwest Angle. Uh, it's in Minnesota. It's the only bit of, uh, north of, of, of America that's north of the 49th parallel. And uh, most people don't even know it's there, including most of the residents. But uh, Jefferson sort of winkled it out of Canada because he was absolutely sure that the source of the Mississippi was there. He was more or less convinced that, uh, the, that there was a tributary that led uh, a river that led water into the lake of uh, whatever, the, I can't even remember the lake's called, now it's a great name, uh, in the no Northwest Angle. And he tried to steal the top of the Great Lakes from Canada as well, but they kind of got very angry about that. But they gave him this little hump on the top of Minnesota. And uh, of course, it wasn't the source, but he didn't mind, it was extra land. The source of the river is at this place called Lake Atasca. It's kind of like, what's that wonderful guy that writes the Lake Woebegone series? That's it. Uh, like a, one of his things, but uh, it's wonderful to see this strange lake. And I went at a time where mainly there weren't a lot of people. And my guide who took me there is an old friend. We grew up together. She's going to come down for this thing. But in the, in the autumn, when before everything starts to, to really bloom, it's wonderful when the trees start to, uh, when, the, when, they're, when they're skeletal. But one of the Indian guys that I was working with there, said, I was looking for the river, which is sort of stupid. You know, it flows out of this lake, and, and I couldn't find it. And he said to me, well, look harder. And I said, well, you know, fuck, guy's on my shoulder. I'm looking as hard as I can. I can't see any goddamn water at all. And he said, the dark path is the river. And it just, it, it thrilled me. And began a process of trying very early on to understand both what that might mean specifically for a group of, I think it's silver birch and bog cotton um, in the, the beginnings of the Mississippi River. Uh, made me very, very pleased. I like making pictures like this a lot. And uh, it, for me, is, it has a, a, a kind of, a, a beauty that allows in black and white, the black and white and gray to turn to silver. And the silver is really kind of exciting to me. But uh, also the Irish in me or in my wife likes the idea that bog cotton is also in America as well as in Ireland. Uh, pleased me very much. So that began the, the Mississippi series, of which there are a group of pictures here that uh, through the kindness of of Christie and a gentleman named Michael Govan, a colleague of his, ended up in the New Orleans Biennale and that the Lannans, as they have so often, um, helped me produce. It's really important when you work with one sort of similar object matter, it's important to me anyway, over and over and over, <clears throat> to try and use that object, in this case the object of water, and brush and trees, three objects maybe, in such a way as to extend the vocabulary of what that kind of object matter might mean. Because most people, I believe, make a mistake when they look at photographs and assume that because they recognize the object of a photograph that they automatically know what the subject matter is. Object, subject, linguistic nonsense kind of is really important to me. So. Of course, there are pictures of water, it's a photograph, bush and trees and weather and wind and stuff, but 
maybe is not entirely what the subject of the pictures are about. Uh, very quickly, the historical associations of how the river was used by the white conquistadors, I guess, the uh, only way I can really think of it, um, who became in control of it, became part of the overriding subject of how I approached making pictures. I can't quite remember where this is, but <clears throat> I think it might be on the Arkansas or the Illinois. It's the confluence of the Illinois and the Upper Mississippi. Oh, that's fantastic. It's in uh, Jersey County, Illinois. Yeah, and what's wonderful, you make a lot of pictures, and, and do whatever you do regularly, and at some point, uh, autopilot comes into play, and autopilot is the kill killer. So all of a sudden, it's from the very beginning thinking, okay, I was refreshed by making pictures uh, on a more modest scale that included, that had actually growing things in them. But right from the beginning, from this picture, I realized that what attracted me to the site was that I was looking at drowned trees. Now that may seem just sort of, so what, who cares? But from the very first picture, and I only make one picture in each site, one negative, I thought, okay, maybe there's something to this thing about how living matter is consumed by something more dominant, but not necessarily more obviously so, but still, be, still remains extant. So I made a decision from that first picture to pursue whenever possible in this, from the source to the sea of the Mississippi, uh, a, a relationship of if it was there, uh, and it turned out to be ever present, uh, the fringed way that trees along <coughs> a, a river that floods rather regularly uh, will drown and stay in place, but yet stay in place. So all through this, drowned trees are are part of the metaphor of the work. The Illinois, part of the process of working with the Mississippi is most of the great rivers on the eastern half of America uh, confl I don't know, join? Conf I don't know what the word for confluence is, conflu? Thank you, conflate? Thank you. <clears throat> I wondered, that makes sense, anyway, join. Uh, so I decided to work with all of them, uh, all of the great rivers that I could that moved <clears throat> to join the Mississippi in its downward movement to the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. And of course, keeping in mind at all times when these rivers were discovered, uh, thinking about the pioneer times, and it's part of this thing that in the text that accompanies the work that I call occasional notes on a history of the outdoors in America or some such thing. So. But what I like about this picture is it's really complicated. Uh, and it's hard to make a picture like this, although it looks pretty simple. And so each picture becomes a, a process by which I'm able to try and extend the vocabulary of making pictures with water and the limited amount of stuff that surrounds water. Uh, and also challenge myself to become a better picture maker. And in this case, become very, very convinced about, ah, okay, the drowned trees metaphor was going to continue through the entirety of the body of work. Uh, these are pictures I'm exceedingly fond of, by the way, which doesn't make them good, it's just that I like them a lot. I was going to get to this point no matter what. Um, my father's ancestors, I'm a, my father was a tribal, guy, he was a Cherokee, <clears throat> I was obviously half or whatever he was. Um, but his, his ancestors were uh, all thrown out of their tribal lands uh, as a result of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Interesting, an actual formal congressional act that did ethnic cleansing um, and then uh, left forcibly under the Trail of Tears march and ended up in Oklahoma at the Indian Nations. This is one of the embarkation sites um, 
or de-embarkation site, where you go, you leave on the Trail of Tears, and I can't remember the state, but I needed to get to this place because my wife is a genealogist and has found that some of my father's ancestors left from this site. We're, we're sorry, Mississippi. And I, I really needed to get there. And when I found the site, because I find places on maps, I never look at Google anything, and I go open and new to a site I've never seen and then expect to create a conversation. And the first thing I saw was weeping willows. Mm -hmm. uh, and just the nature of the tree in relation to the site uh, uh, on the, the leaving point. Uh, Trail of Tears really, really hammered me. Uh, part of my my ancestry, which I owe a great deal to, as it turns out. Uh, and so, with my gigantic silly feet, I sent my friend and guide off to do an errand, and I. It's on the Mississippi River. Everything's safe. What can happen? I clunk into this place and uh, get all set up and start trying to make this picture with all these things, the, the trees, the evidence of the tangles and the uprights of the trees and their color are very important to me in relation to this sweeping touch that concludes there of, and there of, the, of where the weeping meets the trail. Uh, but I kept sorting the picture upside down and backwards, dark cloth, and I kept thinking, God damn, the tripod's getting bigger. Uh, so I started to have to look up, and I couldn't figure out what was doing. I'm very focused on these things, and, and I thought, fuck, what's going on? I'm getting smaller, or something, the tripod's growing, this can't happen. I look down, and I've managed to walk into a sinkhole. Uh, and my guide's not, friend's not there, and I'm sinking. And I tried to get out. Sinkhole, unlike quicksand, is thick, gooey mud, and it's very, very, very weird. And it, you, I couldn't get out. Always first thought, make the picture. I could still reach the camera. Um, so, and I did. I made the picture. Stay calm. You just have to panic, does, which I incur a lot. It doesn't help. And I got the dark slide back in, and by then I'm reaching. So I'm, I'm finally about up to there. And it was very, very disconcerting. And the, fortunately, the tripod and the camera didn't weigh enough, so they were secure, which was my second thought, uh, worry about. But I, I couldn't get out. I would wear Danner uh, combat boots for, for uh, walking. There's the, the, I'm not happy with the military, but they have really good products. Uh, the Marines and Special Forces use these boots, and they're the, probably the best all-around walking boot that you can't break the, in existence. And, and I um, just, I'm, I can't get out, I'm pulling, pulling, and the more I pull, the more I sink, and my guide friend is gone, and I'm thinking, well, I'm, f I'm fucked, finally, this is the end. And, uh, and then, this, it was very strange, this, I don't know what you call a group, but uh, not a swarm, but a group of 15 to, 50 to 100 white butterflies just started coming, circling me. And weirdly, the only thing I could think of, it sounds schmaltzy, but I thought, okay, my old man's ancestors saying sayonara, you know. Um, uh, uh, but it was, it, was, it was a wonderful, but kind of, both saddening thing because they just came out of nowhere and sort of whirled around and <coughs> never ever touched me and then left. And by then I think I'm up for the high jump and uh, my friend guide finally comes and I'm yelling and she's yelling because she feels responsible but I'd send her off to do an errand. And, but she's a cowgirl and we had these ropes in the back of the truck. <laughs> she roped me like a cow. <coughs> and tied it onto the back of the truck and pulled me out with this rope by the truck. But I was in so deep uh, that my boots, which were 10 inch high, were sucked off my feet. Now, that's an almost physical impossibility. So this picture is really important to me emotionally, but also it was a last roundup type thing as well. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Were you standing in the water for all of these? I was standing uh, either in or at water's edge for 100% of them. I like that. I like the contact. It's a lovely thing that you ask, Frank, because uh, I, I usually wear boots. If I don't want to wreck the boots, I'll go barefoot. Or if it's really cold, I've got a suit that allows me to do that. And, uh, and if I can get the vantage point in the water, that's great. And if I have to be off the water, which I was for, for this one here, um, which is the counterport. I made this one and was, you know, and thought, okay. Uh, I turned around and then saw this, which was about 100 meters behind me from there. I thought, okay, I have to do this just simply because of this strange little indicatory kind of promontory pointing to the last trail of the Cherokee. So I call this one the last goodbyes and this is something else, but on the Trail of Tears. And to be honest, I started the Mississippi Works personally to, to make these, to make that picture anyway, and found I could make this one as well. And I'm on this, uh, the shore edge. I like being in the material I work with, but vantage point is really important to me. So if I get a better vantage point on a cliff edge or on a rock, uh, I'm, I'm happy, But because uh, I, I don't swim. And, I like being in water, but I don't like it sort of more than chest height. It makes me a little nervous. Um, but um, and then this one, this one preceded the, the Mississippi work, and I did it entirely as a result of a visit uh, to the Lannans in, I think, in 2002. And I, I kept it. They ended up with it in a, a sister on the Pecos River. But this is, uh, f in 2002, I don't know what the hell I was doing, or three, maybe it was three, um, uh, but I thought I'd drive from here, I had some time, I'd drive from here to see if I could find the old homestead of my father's tribal grandparents and, uh, and just pay respects, you know. Uh, family being what it is. I left home when I was 16 and father was a difficult person, but he was a much better man than I. And I never ever, I never knew that until I knew it. And he was gone at that point. So I thought, okay, you old bastard, I'll make you a picture. Uh, and wherever you are in the world, uh, you'll get it or you won't, but it won't matter because I'll finally be able to say something. So I've, it took me about four days to find this site. And it's on a little creek called the Little Blue off another creek, off, which off, is off another river in the northeast of Oklahoma. And it's the exact site of my father's tribal grandparents, um, whatever, homestead. Uh, and I, I learned how to make a really good picture that day. Uh, I'm interested in picture making. Well, lots of things, stories, history, geography, geology, all kinds of shit inspires me. But mainly what I'm interested in is making really good pictures with the materials of water and trees and grass and rock and, and wind and weather and that, that are my materials. So because this was made as a precedent in a way, it fit for me into the what became the Mississippi River pictures because it was uh, the result of having been expelled from one homeland to find another. And by Christ, they found it. And what wonderful thing it is that, and it's inspiring to me because uh, I like the idea of tumbleweed. You know, here it's everywhere. But uh, at a certain point, when you have no choice, demands of circumstance take over and you do what you need to do to figure out how to get by. And I, I like that. I've looked that. If I learned anything from my own particular family weirdness was that, and uh, it was a great lesson. I'm really interested in Lewis and Clark, uh, which is why the Missouri is also on my mind. Uh, can you imagine, and I, I, it sounds stupid, but can you imagine when there was no motorways, no freeways, when there were no roads, the other paved roads. You know, imagine the, I mean, it was still in 1803 when they started 
or conclude, I can't remember, 18.2, I think it was 18.3, 18.3 um, to 18.5, um, I think. Uh, the easiest way to travel anywhere was by water, always was, until the late 19th century or the mid-19th century when a train happened, and then later than that <coughs> paved, really seriously paved roads, and subsequently the, the automobile. But can you imagine starting somewhere approximately, let's say Mr. Jefferson has called Mr. Clark and Mr. Lewis and said, boys, here's a project. Here's A, and A is Washington. And B, fuck, I don't know where it is, but it's way the other way out there. Now all I want you to do is go there and come back and tell me what you see and write down how much it's worth, by the way while you're doing it. Gobsmacking. It's as gobsmacking as some of the great narrative explorations of the Renaissance, and we take it for granted. This picture was made at the site of the Dubois River as it joins the Mississippi at the site of Wood Camp, where Lewis and Clark finally figure out how to cross the Mississippi. And I was just gobsmacked by it. Gobsmack. First, the light was lovely, and fuck, I'm from Glasgow, there's no light, it's always raining and gray and shit, I, there's never any shadows, it was wonderful. And it was late afternoon, and there wasn't a soul, there wasn't even a mosquito, you know, God, it was just quiet, just quiet, and I thought, I'm going to make one of the killer's pictures, and I made this, but thinking about what happens when you go off the map. Everybody knew the Great River, the, in this case, the father of waters, the Mississippi, mother, whatever it is. Boy, crossing that and then getting all the way across. No roads, no maps. They were smart, had real help. Indians knew the shit all the time. Uh, and no one got killed. God, absolutely unheard of. One person died, but no one got killed. You would have thought that if they'd learned, the Americans had learned the lessons of Lewis and Clark in 1803, forgive me for saying this, it would have been a slightly better country. But uh, they didn't. So there we are. I like this. So the story about movement. History teaches me how to begin to approach things I don't know anything about. And I'm, I'm interested in all kinds of things, but history, geology, and geography are the three things that move me, I guess, to think about trying to approach the unknown outdoor world, which most of it is to me. I'm moving further south. I'm making groups of pictures that include, they're not here, um, my daughter, my eldest daughter is named Laura, and in part we named her Laura after Laura Ingalls Wilder. And uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder was born on the upper Mississippi. Now, the Mississippi is so long, it's divided absolutely into the upper and the lower Mississippi. And I have always made pictures when I can at places where, for me, great writers have done things. So I made a picture at the birthplace of Laura Ingalls Wilder and then further on down in Hannibal, Missouri, to say thank you to... Uh, Mark Twain, and, but particularly Jim of, uh, 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 you know, Huckleberry um, Finn, and then further on down to that mythical place that I can't even pronounce that starts with a Y where Faulkner wrote all his shit from, um, and it just made me, it's a way of saying thank you guys or gals, you know, ah, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, and then carry on. but. Other kinds of history, the weird kind of formations called oxbow lakes. So maybe some of you are like me, and I doubt it, that watch cowboy movies. I'm an avid cowboy, if I collect cow, sad bastard. But um, I, there's a great Henry Fonda early cowboy called the Oxbow Incident. Um, and. Um, I've, all, I've never seen an oxbow lake. I didn't know what one looked like. And then in my reading, I found out that the largest oxbow lake in America is uh, part of the Mississippi. And it also had enormous historical importance. The 
European that discovered the Mississippi was Hernan de Soto. And he discovered the Mississippi in 1542. And as luck would have it, he probably deserved it. By 1543, he croaked. Uh, he croaked at this lake, uh, which I can't remember the name of at the moment, and was buried in the lake, the largest oxbow lake in the world. Or in the, sorry? Lake Chilcot, Chilcot, Lake Chilcot, uh, adjacent to the Mississippi, uh, where the discoverer, your white eyed discoverer, uh, and I thought this was appropriate. But what was wonderful is there was, the wind was just coming up really, probably 40 mile an hour wind. And it was, it was weird because it was a nice, really sunny day, but I thought, okay, I can use this. I couldn't. So I set up watching the branches of this peculiar tree flap there, and then the water come up on this little bit of shore. I'm kind of far out into the lake on a bit. And then the shoreline split through the tree side movement here, and I thought, both the history and the geology, but also picture making. God, it was so exciting just to make a kind of picture where I thought, ultimately, what's wonderful about things like this blur and stuff is I think of it as erasure. I've always been, my, one of my favorite artworks of all times is when Jasper Johns erased the de Kooning drawing. And I, I've, I've tried several times to figure out how to steal it. And uh, it's, it's funny how incredibly small it is, but there, it's actually pinned down, and I've sadly counted, there's eight different points of contact to that picture to the wall. Um, that's how serious I was. Uh, but erasure is really important to me. Um, I use it a lot, either through time, long time exposures in the water, or through slightly less long, but still equally important time of bl wind blowing stuff. Further on down, <coughs> I, uh, I had to, I'm getting close to New Orleans, and I had to, I had to look at Poncha, Lake Pontchartrain. God, how wonderful, Jesus. And uh, the Pontchartrain is the guy who, amongst other things, discovered the lake, but the Duke or his pals, but he's the guy that named Louisiana after the Sun King. And, um, and therefore we have the name. But it's a very, it's just, well, Louisiana's a strange place. But um, I, I work through all periods of the night and the day, and uh, this was early sunrise, I, sun, sun, I think it was sunrise, it might have been sunset, but I th it looks like sunrise to me right now. And there was a, a, a surface wind across the lake, and these, again, all, all drowned trees, always drowned trees, over and over and over, uh, drowned cypress in the lake, and uh, sun just coming on the edge of the lake, catching the shadows. I thought, Jesus Christ, this is, and I'm in, as Frank mentioned, I'm in it this time, I couldn't help it. And it, the, the lake bed was firmer than I thought. I thought it'd be gooey, but it was somehow much more firm. But this strange, ghostly thing seemed appropriate to how weird I was experiencing Louisiana to be at that time. I've always understood Southern Gothic a bit, but I experienced it firsthand here. And then a year previous, I made these all in 2010 and as pictures, and I, I make things and just put them in a drawer, make the proofs and wait and look at them and think about them. And I waited four years until uh, Christy and Michael Govan came to see them and showed them to them and thought maybe, and then the opportunity came up, but I, I wait. So if things can wait that you will perhaps receive uh, <clears throat> 10 to 12 years before I finally figure out these things need a life publicly. So the aim is to make them, these were made in 210, but make them alive, or what I call live, 2014. I, all my pictures have two dates, or generally have two dates, the making of the negative, the making of the picture for public view. My brother 
I was very lucky, and again, I'm sure it was because of you guys. I, I won a Guggenheim Grant Fellowship thing in 2009, and I was thrilled. Christ, old guys get, get such a chance, unusually. And I used it to begin the, making pictures on the eastern seaboard for the last part of this project, the Atlas project that I'm working on. My brother very kindly guided me. I can't drive and think at the same time, which is, uh, suggests I have no capacity for multitasking. I was signing some books for Mr. Chicky at Radius, and he started talking to me, and I, I forgot what I was supposed to do, and then I couldn't remember my name. Um, uh, so it, it's a sign of a sad thing that uh, I, I need guides that who are also can drive, because I can't think and drive at the same time. Because uh, all I do is just look around. Anyway, my brother, we started, kind of top of the eastern seaboard and work down, uh, finally get to the to New Orleans and go down. The, the road stops, as you will probably all know, oddly, in a place called Venice on the Delta. Um, and if any of you have ever seen Beasts of the Southern Wild, it's worth keeping, it's just wonderful. But <clears throat> so my brother and I, he's more or less fearless. I hate snakes, but we started walking along the the edge for about five or six miles, and I saw whatever happened here um, and was, made this picture. And then as I made it, I realized that I'd done something stupid and uh, what I thought was probably had ruined the picture, which caused this, I, it became sunstruck and very seriously blasted by sunlight while I was making the picture on the raw film. Um, and then I came back and I said, oh, I screwed that up, but that's my one. Um, and he was cheerful about it, which was sweet. But I said, well, wait till you get back and see what it looks like. And I developed a negative and then proofed it and saw this strange thing and thought, oh, yes. I, don't, I, don't, I can't exactly explain why, but again, it's about erasure. In this case, once again, a, a natural erasure that finally said, whatever was the picture that might have been, the picture that is partially erased is so much better and so much more interesting and so much more lively. Uh, and I thought, thank you, thank you, thank you. So my disaster turned out to be my delight here. These, you will know, I, my first river pictures were the Rio Grande. I came here in, a long time ago and studied at the University of um, New Mexico and fell in love with this place and thought about the Rio Grande for a long time and then read that great book called The Great River by Paul, Paul starts with an H, what's his last name anyway, very famous, anyway, historian of the, of the Rio Grande. And, you know, it's fucking paperback, it's like that thick. Uh, you need a wrist rest to read a book like that. Um, but it, it just knocked me out, and I thought, okay, mm, I can do this. And, you know, then growing, in, if you will, up around the work of Laura Gilpin and a whole bunch of others, I knew the pictorial history of the river. But what I knew, that I knew, was that in spite of the fact that they had fabulous access, I knew something different. And so over what I think turned out to be something that I started in 1994 and finished, as it turns out, finally in 2006. Uh, I worked from the source of the river uh, in Colorado to Boca Chica and um, um, the other side to the Rio, mouth of the Rio Bravo um, on the literal other side. So the three pictures here begin this journey that took me from took me 12 years uh, to which I concluded in 2006 and uh, will be presenting pictures from the picture at the top uh, in 19 it was 1994 or 95 there was a six day blizzard where it's in New Mexico and southern Colorado where it snowed three feet in six days and uh, of course that's when I was here so that's when I was making the pictures. <clears throat> and I finally managed in this little pissy car, two-door thing that was about the size of me, uh, 
going through closed roads and getting to the source. And, and I'm standing across the Rio Grande River thinking, what in the hell am I going to do now? Now, for a guy, that's a bad thought. Um, <laughs> um, I won't go further. Um, but what, at the top, the little white band at the top of that picture is where the, the river sources into a snow bank. But above me, four great things happened during the time of making these particular pictures. That, uh, and the first was above me. Were, was the keening of a pair of geese that were stranded from its flock. They couldn't get above cloud line. And they were going around, I don't know another word, when well, there's a word, but can, what do geese do when they're sad? And, sorry? Can, can, Canada geese, sorry? Is, but uh, blizzard time, I, I'm not sure it was February or March. That's it, thank you, thank you. But they, they were lost and they couldn't get above the snow line and they were going around and around and making these wild plaintive sounds and it was a pair so obviously together and I just thought Jesus you know and there wasn't a soul and no one could even get there it was snowed in I was snowed in for a day in this car but I finally made this picture straddling the Rio Grande with this pair of geese above me and I made a little book of I think of his poems called wild about that experience and then running into uh, a flock of wild turkeys at the source of the Canadian River in the northeast of New Mexico, uh, scratching. I, I saw, I thought there were trees moving, small bushes. They were scratching in the snow and this blizzards was coming down. And I just heard the scratching and they were, you know, turkey's not a smart animal. Uh, I get within 20 feet of them and they're still just looking around. And then I, I surprised a doe and her fawn uh, in some other place. And uh, then at the, the confluence of the, of the north and the south forks of the, God, it's well, the other great river in south, southeastern Colorado, I'll think of it, of the San Juan. I'm looking, trying to figure out how to make a picture. I turn around, there's eight cow elk in a semicircle around me, just looking at me, like, you stupid bastard, what are you doing here? Um, uh, and and I, I, I knew if I turned my body, they'd, they'd, they'd move, so I just turned my head, and we looked at each other, and they snorted at me a little bit, and figured that I was dumb enough to be left alone. And, uh, but oh, God, truly, it was seriously wonderful moment. So that began with this picture. And then the second picture, relative to the same time, uh, 1994-95, I made under the, uh, the bridge of the Rio Grande as you begin in, in Albuquerque as you leave to go south. So I was living in Albuquerque. And then finally at Boca Chica, the, some more or less, a little less than 2,000 miles further down the road at the Texas-Mexico border, I went on, uh, God, I, I thought I was being really cute. I was sort of going through the big bend and all kinds of shit there. And I timed myself to arrive at Boca Chica, which uh, you can get to my four-wheel drive from the road, which is five miles, it ends five miles before the beach, and you drive along the beach to this site. I timed it to arrive on Cinco de Mayo, thinking I'm a really smart person. You know, it'll be there at the Mexican national holiday, and this was a, you know, it's going to be great, and there's going to be nobody there. Well, little did I know, there was 25,000 Mexican-Americans having a party uh, on the beach. Uh, and of course, uh, people were crossing the river because nobody cared on that one day. I thought, oh, I fucked myself completely. Uh, and I was, you know, the only gringo in 25,000 people in a picnic is pretty conspicuous. And so I got, saw the site and immediately apologized my way for five miles out through people's picnics. Thought, okay, I'll come back on the 6th. And I thought, the place will be trashed. God, you know, absolutely destroyed with litter and everything. And I went back and there's not a speck. 
It was completely pristine. 25, and there were at least 25,000 people having a really good time. Uh, there wasn't a soul, there was nothing. It was quiet. I went really early in the morning. And it was, I thought, oh, wow, what a lesson. It was beautiful. So I finally get to this site, and I wanted to make sure that the picture I made at the mouth, the little mouth, uh, had both Mexico and America in it. And so I, uh, of course, stood in the in Rio Grande. And Rio Grande's a tricky little river, which I'd found out previously by falling into some quicksand that Patrick knows about. That was a close call. But there was all these seagulls, and I thought, what the? They're in the way, you know? They're, seagulls are not unlike penguins. Uh, they're, they're, in, they're everywhere, and they're always in the way. So I thought, I'll whistle them out. And I have, or had in the bad old days, enough lung power to have a hefty whistle, and, and that didn't work. So I thought, okay, I'll throw rocks at them. And that didn't work. They were exactly like penguins, but I didn't know that then. And then I thought, okay, fuck, they're there. And so I'm just about ready to make the picture and start the exposure, and they flew by themselves. <coughs> Made the picture. Made me so happy. Let's say 10, 12 years later, this is 94, 95. In 2006, I finally, coming up through Central America, got and the east coast of America, of Mexico, got through um, Matamoros and then to the, the mouth of what the Mexicans, as you will know, call the Rio Bravo. And my guide, an old guy, even older than I at the time, was wonderful. He said, I never thought I'd get to see the Great River. Because uh, I had to make the sister picture to this. And there's another one where I'm standing in the middle of the river that hasn't been seen that will be as well. But he said, I never saw, thought I'd see the Great River. He said, thank you, thank you. I said, well, I have this idea. I made the picture. I said, I want to be a wetback. He said, what? I said, I have this, there was a truck stop, say about two miles down below the beach where we were. I said, let's get some truck inner tubes and let's cross the river. I'll leave the passports and all our shit in your truck. There's nobody around. I know the road that comes to the American side of the beach. There's nobody on it. Let's sneak across into America. He said, no, 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 we'll get shot. No, 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 on, on. We'll get shot, we'll get arrested. No, no, there's nobody there. We can do this. He said, I don't swim. And I said, well, I don't either. Um, and he said, well, how are we going to do this? And I said, well, we can share an inner tube, a truck inner tube. Two of us can make it happen. And so if you can imagine one old Mexican guy and one old fucked up gringo guy, I finally convinced him and we sneak across, we get this truck inner tube. <sighs> it's wonderful. One of the great things of my life, as it turns out. And uh, we, we illegally crossed the border at the mouth of the Rio Bravo. And little did we know, because it doesn't look like there's a lot of water. Real Boca Chica means little mouth because there's not a lot of water. It looks like going through, but the current's really hefty there. And we start to get moved out into the sea. We both start to get really nervous and paddle like the dogs we were. And we're in our underwear, which is even worse. And but we make it across. And there's not a soul on either side. He said, America. And... I'm in tears by this point because I learned something about need and desire and the possibility of belief that I don't know anything about that's always false somehow, it seems to me. And he just kept saying, America, America. And then five or ten minutes we get scared and go back and finally get back. And I know what it's like to cross illegally as I've done it. And uh, it was pretty exciting. Anyway, those are the kind of things that I do with these kinds of river pictures. With the small things here, about my oppressive disbelief in influence. I hate all ideas of influence. Uh, 
people use the word influence in relation to inspiration, and I, I, I renounce influence. The idea of spheres of influence turns me into a pillar of salt. All influence by its nature is fascistic. It's about power and about external determinants that uh, are placed on a person or a place or a thing. I won't have it as much as I can do without it, but I am filled with inspiration by things, which for me is a singular, very personal, usually emotive and, and developmental thing that has nothing to do with the transferal or emplacement of power from one thing to another, but in a way a gifting of understanding of stuff between people, maybe. There was an old dead guy named Timothy H. O'Sullivan, and he, for me, was, along with Paul Cezanne, the two greatest outdoor picture makers of the 19th century. Everybody knows Cezanne. Cezanne started working on Mont saint where I've also worked making a picture to Cezanne and laterally O'Sullivan in 1874. Um, and wonderful shit. And, but most people that have gone to that part of France or they think about it, there's a, a quarry area that was an ancient quarry, might have even been Roman, but worked for a long time at the foot of the mountain called Bibamus Quarry that he also worked in. And uh, it was pretty exciting. But the reason I mention it is that in 1874, this great American outdoor picture maker named O'Sullivan made his last pictures. He worked for seven years. He was a Civil War photographer for Matthew Brady. And then he and this old guy named Alexander Gardner, um, who Gardner came from Paisley, Scotland, and O'Sullivan came from somewhere near Cork in Ireland. And um, they put together this, the first great, I believe, anti-war picture book in the history of, possibly of pictures, but certainly in the history of photography called The Photographic Sketchbook of the War. It came out in 1867. And uh, Gardner put it together with his work and 55, there's 100 pictures, 55 of those Sullivan's pictures. And then Sullivan probably had what we would call sort of a, whatever they call the stuff of when you've been in war too long and it makes you crazy. Sorry? That's it. And he went, he, he, he sort of disappeared for two years. But then in, um, actually, then in 1867, the year that the, the book was published, he joined the American survey uh, teams that started to photograph across the west of America and made pictures for seven years that were as radical and as extraordinary and as adventurous and as unpredictable as anything I'd ever seen in my life. And like I say, not unlike his unknown brother in France, Cezanne, Paul Cezanne. And I first saw this guy's work in pictures in 1965, and I thought about him and thought about him and thought about him. Basically spent 35 years thinking about this old dead guy and how good he was and how short he worked for a period of time. He got TB and had to leave the field in 1874. He died when he was 42, as did Alexander Gardner, same year. They both died of tuberculosis. It was not a great thing, um, 1882. So I thought, okay, hmm, maybe I can do something. I met a gentleman who became a very dear friend of me uh, named Toby Jurovix, and he was working at uh, Princeton University Art Museum at the time, and he said, well, you know, you've talked about this O'Sullivan stuff so long, why don't you do something? I said, well, I'm thinking about it. And he said, you spent 35 years. Don't you think that's enough? Um, I said, well, it's just about. And he said, well, and then he proposed getting a benefactor, whom I believe you know, um, uh, to uh, finance a two-week trip to the place where O'Sullivan made his last pictures, which I had been thinking about since 1965 and he made these pictures in 1874 at this place called Shoshone Falls. Shoshone Falls was called the Niagara of the West. It was 52 or 54 feet higher than Niagara. And between Niagara, or between Niagara, Shoshone, and Yosemite Falls, they became the great kind of 
cascades that represented, the, if you will, the natural possibilities of this, of, of the treasure of America, of really the natural treasure of America. And Toby knew something, however, I didn't, and he never told me uh, that we, I said, great, let's do this. We spent two weeks through a July 4th in, um, in Idaho, where on July 4th we watched at a drive-in movie, uh, an Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator movie, where uh, people were in their pickups with their rocking chairs in the back and their shotguns in their laps. And I thought, wow, America, <laughs> I haven't seen this in a long time. Uh, and it was real. And then after the movie, as part of the fireworks, they started shooting guns. Um, and it may, you may think, because uh, I think about it all the time, it's fantastic and relatively harmless to shoot the bullet up, but it comes down at the same speed as it goes up. And if you're underneath, you're dead, just as accidentally as if you'd been shot purposefully. Uh, and I, I'm, you know, it always makes me nervous, uh, but uh, shotguns probably didn't matter a lot. Anyway, make, make this body of work. But he didn't tell me that, Somewhere between after World War II and the mid-50s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers diverted the entire waterfall uh, into agricultural water. So there's no water off the, what was the, the greatest waterfall in the West. I didn't know this. So I arrive, we spend two weeks, and I make a body of work that culminates in a way, this is the, the I think it's 254 feet high. This is the, the bedrock of the fall, the dry bedrock. And no one, the Army Corps of Engineers controls it still, and they don't allow anybody on it. So I worked in the source of the Snake River. It's called Snake River for a reason. It goes like this, but also during the summer, the per capita head of rattlesnakes is really alarming. Uh, it's astonishing, it's really, it's also the place where Evil Knievel tried to jump the gorge. God damn, what a guy, you know? He, got, he was crazy as a bat, but wow, what he could do with a motorcycle. I just, absolutely fantastic. I tried to imagine the leap. It's, you know, it's at least 300 feet uh, from rim to rim. And he almost did it. God, it was amazing. Anyway, that's the kind of place it is. So I make this group of pictures from, from where the snake starts to come into the gorge of the, of, of the basin that became the waterfall, not knowing, of course, until I'm there that the waterfall I expected to be filled with water was empty, so having to deal with that. And made this body of work as if it was, I was like, it sounds really stupid, but I felt like I was a human torch. I was just lit up. It was also 120 degrees in the f floor of the uh, canyon, and little things happened that, where can I, where is it? When film gets really hot, it can change in a way, it's called solarized. Uh, sun heat or heat, just heat heat can do it, and it changes the physical structure of the negative. And when it's 120 in the shade, uh, it can happen. And the, the, the tonal thing that you're looking here is, is at here is a result of the sun cooking the negative so much it changed the physical structure of the film and created opportunities for, I made the picture because of the light on this rim, but it becomes slightly different as a result of being solarized. And I made, uh, the, the only water coming off Shoshone Falls is at this little bit of trickle called Bridal Falls. And this again is, I think, in 204 I made these. And then thanks to the Lannan Foundation and Radius Books, uh, they were published in 2010 and subsequently exhibited in a couple of places at this size. It's a working size. I mean, I've never seen these pictures until now. I made them, but I've not seen them. Um, finalized, so I'm, it's thrilling. But this little thing is called Bridal Falls, and this is the fall of the falls, pissy little thing here. I started thinking about, as one would, I think, about Hokusai. And 
watching high water mark uh, when the river was flooding in winter on dry rock. And then thinking, of course, about the prints that Hokusai did about certain similar types of themes that included high water mark and also a broken boulder. Uh, so these are to Hokusai through O'Sullivan. But then towards the end of our very short stay, and I'm working like a mad fiend. Remember, there's only one picture in each site. And I just think I, I was devouring the place. It was fun, it was exciting. And with regard to inspiration, I owed O'Sullivan. He became a living teacher to me. I learned how to try and be more dangerous, more, less predictable, if that is possible to say without being stupid. And I wanted to do something once that would say, thank you, Tim, and, and goodbye. We finally got permission to be the first people that were non-governmental to walk the rim of the falls, Toby and I. And I made two pictures that I will live and die by, these two, the last two. Uh, they're almost sequential, funnily enough, in terms of their ma making here of my first view down into the Snake River Basin from the top of the dry falls bed of Shoshone Falls at uh, uh, early evening, and then the last view late night. These are two of the very best pictures I've ever made in my whole life. I'm interested in using material in such a way if erasure is really part of something that is important to me, and it is, to both have stuff and remove it as much as possible. Get rid of it. And I get very close to getting rid of stuff while still having it in these pictures. And actually, in all of these pictures. So uh, it's, a, fuck, it's a potted thing. I'm sorry, any, any questions? This probably has bored you past this point of being uh, humane, but this is what I do, this is how they're made. None of it matters because however you approach, however anyone approaches the pictures is however they're supposed to be seen. There are no rules. It's just that what I do is purposeful. And it doesn't matter me, to me at all if my purpose isn't anybody else's purpose, but I find it at, at least pleasant that my purpose is acknowledged. You know, uh, that's all. That's all that's necessary. <laughs> Jesus, I've been shaking for half an hour now. Um, is, it, is there anything that anybody besides drinks and shouting? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, ma'am. No, no, no. Uh, Laura was, God, I, I, it's, she's not part of this group, but she will be. She's coming to you, um, as is uh, Mark and as is William. Um, but she's, a, she's in the upper Mississippi. These are all in the lower Mississippi. And, and her picture is a very bright rock, um, so bright it's white, which I often, I kept thinking, I don't know what she looked like, of course, and really don't want to know, but I imagine that this rock was a place that as a kid she might have sat on and dangled her toes in the water, which is why I made the picture. And, and is this all Idaho here or is it different parts? Is this different parts of... Yeah, this is all part of uh, starting at the, uh, I'm not sure, the angle, let's say the, 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 the water is the Snake River, so it's the Snake River before it reaches the, 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 um, what do you call it? the falls head, I guess, of Shoshone Falls, and then it, as it drops, or it would have dropped into the basin, and must somehow mer emerge through the, the limestone of the, of, of the rock face into the basin, and then, um, then, and then looking, it's looking towards, looking at, looking down, and then looking back. Yes, ma'am. Was any particular river something that you got into and said, ah, oh, yeah, um, this feels My old man's right. tribal grandparents. I shouldn't have been there. 
I was, I'm a white boy. I was Indian territory. I shouldn't have been there, but I needed to put my, it's, it's a weird thing. I have this compulsion. I have to touch the rocks. It's, I'm not a tree hugger, but I, I like to touch the trees. And I like to put my hands in the water. When I lived in Albuquerque, I would hitchhike every weekend. It's 1,200 miles from Albuquerque to where I went to in California. I put my hands and feet in the Pacific Ocean, then I'd hitchhike back. It took three days. And I did every week in for two years just to touch the stuff. And there's, it's a pathology I can't explain, to be honest with you, because I can't swim. Uh, and I'm not interested. Cold, who wants to be in cold water? It's not normal. Um, but I, I want to touch the stuff. And that's the other thing. My pictures are physical. They're made by hand. They're about touch and sensory experience and feeling. And, and I try and put as much of that through the sense of tone and light and other nonsense that's in it as possible. But touch is, take touch away, I might as well stop. Yes, ma'am? Could you talk a little bit about the camera? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's simple. It's a, I use a camera made in 1898. It's called an Agfa Ansco, uh, five by seven inch view camera. Agfa was a German company. Agfa Ansco was an English company and they came together in New York to try and compete with George Eastman and Kodak. Uh, it's funny, Kodak's gone, Agfa, or Ansco went first, Agfa went in 2006, it's a disaster. Kodak should be ashamed of themselves to kill a company like that, entirely mismanaged. Uh, but anyway, they made cameras to compete with Eastman's cameras, and the guy, the father of the 70-year-old son that I bought the camera from in 1965, was a portrait photographer and he bought the camera new, went west with his family. His son took up the portrait business in my little hometown. And when he was 70, quit and I guess retired, which is something I couldn't imagine. And I bought it from him for the princely sum of his entire studio for $300, which was a lot of money for me, but not much for him, I suspect. And I looked at it as an old view camera. He put it on a tripod look at it through a dark cloth, through it, and the back of it is a ground glass that sh projects the image upside down and backwards. So, and that's a weird thing to, to look at when you're not used to, it's confusing and, and troubling because you can't find anything you recognize because nothing's where it's supposed to be. But after you get used to it, bliss actually, uh, because it takes away the familiarity of everything, but intensifies the sense of it somehow, its vibrancy. Uh, and so I bought this camera in 65, looked at it on a, sort of had it on a mantle for two years, 67, and decided finally from 67 till 69 I would start working with it. And in 1969, and this is, I told this story a lot, but it's the truth, I. There's a canyon south of San Luis Obispo that runs to the sea called S.C. Canyon, S.E.E. -E Canyon. And on April Fool's Day, 1969, seemed appropriate, I thought I'd take a, it's an eight mile walk with this camera and if I could make pictures with it, then that's what I'd use. I finally figured out how to use it. I walked eight miles and I thought, I couldn't see anything. I thought, Jesus, you know, this is a heavy camera. I haven't found anything. This is a disaster. What have I done? I'll go back to my old camera. And I sort of rounded a hill and started coming back to walk back and saw finally the picture that I was going to make and hope to make and this revelation kind of. So it's a camera story and about why I do what I do. I saw this picture and a series of things hit me, and I took a vow. I vowed on that day, April Fool's Day, that I would ever, I'd only ever use this stupid, junky old camera. It is now the only camera I have, and I've only camera I've worked with since April Fool's Day, 1969, and I would make only one picture in one site if I could find the thing to make, because there's just, artists can't help themselves, but there's still too much stuff world. I've made lots of stuff and I try my best to make it at least 
as purposeful as possible by having there be only one. And uh, that I would only ever work outdoors. And I did all that in a one or another. I only ever made two other vows. One was my wedding vow, <laughs> which was the very best thing that ever happened to me. And then the third vow, which seems a little melodramatic, but is really important to me. In martial terms, martial art terms, in Japanese terms, there's a thing called, uh, it's spelled G-I-R-I, and it's either pronounced giri or jiri. I pronounce it jiri, but it may be giri. And it's a formal vow of to the death. And I've taken that formal vow to complete this project. So, uh, and I've never mentioned it before because I thought I might not ever get it done and that would have been shameful. But I'm gonna get it done. And I've taken the vow. And, and it's great. What it does is release you from bullshit. You don't have any more worries other than, well, am I going to fuck this up forever or just a little bit uh, after a vow like that? And uh, so those three vows culminate in the things that I plan on doing. And they're, they're reliefs. They've both narrowed my, my, in a way, my physical activity. There's this, this, and this, but they've opened the emotional activity and the intellectual activity profoundly. So I, the, the, the point of the, the large camera, however, was I very quickly learned early in my life that I was not interested in fastness. I was only interested in slowness. And the slower things could get, funnily enough, and it, it drives people bats, but the slower things, it can be tortuous, I recognize, like listening to me speak, but the slower things get, the more opportunity for an unfolding of understanding seems possible to me. So I've tried everything I can to remove the opportunity for me to do anything faster than I feel like I am able of doing. Uh, although right now I really want uh, a little extra speed wouldn't hurt, to be honest with you, but I, I can only go as fast as I go. But I like the idea that I've made exposures that lasted from sun, sunset to moonrise and from midnight until uh, uh, sunrise and m moments in between that in the time of exposure, my eyes are wide open. But I never also, I never look at what I'm making a picture at. Of. I don't want to see it. So I look around and about. My, I have this, this mental thing that I say, when, it, when I'm working and it's, the weather's bad, I, and I'm, I'm always on my own, but with, with, except for with a guide, I do this little nursery rhyme thing to kind of quiet me down. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. <laughs> Tip me over, pour me out. And I keep saying it over and over and over. And sooner or later, I'm, I'm poured out. Uh, and I'm quiet again. But then when I'm working, I have this, this little thing that goes through my mind that I say to myself, it's locate the edges and the center will take care of itself. Every single time. Locate the edges, the center will take care of itself. And every one of these is testimony to that. I always know where the edge is. I've spent my lifetime trying to find, if you will, the edge of things, which is also my edge and maybe by association other edges. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to find in the firm belief that the center always takes care of itself. It doesn't need any help from anybody, whatever that center is, so I don't mess with it.